Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen zu dieser schönen Veranstaltung, die auch so schön begonnen hat. <lacht> im rhetorischen Einsatz seit 10 Uhr nahezu unausgesetzt. Wir hatten eine sehr schöne zweieinhalb Stunden dauernde Veranstaltung der Sizilienschule mit Abiturienten der Oldenburger Gymnasien. Heute Nachmittag war eine ganze Reihe von Pressegesprächen. Ich bin wieder einmal aufgerufen, zunächst technische Dinge äh, kurz vorzuschieben. Wir haben die Absicht, ein relativ kurzes Podium hier zu machen und dann Ihnen Gelegenheit zu geben, äh, Ihren mehr oder minder temperamentvollen Aussagen entgegenzunehmen. Äh, das soll über Raummikrofone geschehen. Äh, wichtig ist, dass wir nicht zu zweit oder zu dritt sprechen, sondern immer nur ein äh, Teilnehmer spricht, denn wir machen äh, diese Veranstaltung ja mit einer kompletten simultanen Übersetzung. Meine Damen und Herren, meine Aufgabe ist es nun nicht noch einmal zu sprechen, sondern nur ganz kurz die Teilnehmer dieses Podiums vorzustellen. Es ist alles gesagt worden, um Professor Schomsky vorzustellen. Auch von dieser Seite aus nochmal herzlich willkommen hier in Oldenburg und keine weiteren Worte über die Leiden all der Menschen, die über Jahrzehnte Sprachwissenschaft auch in Oldenburg studiert haben und dabei sozusagen <lacht> grammatischen Theorien von Professor Chomsky nicht nur Freude empfunden haben, sondern zeitweise auch gelitten haben. Ganz, ganz viele herzliche Worte allerdings an den Noam Chomsky, weswegen die Jury der Kapten des Kalkos jetzt gefallen ist, der Stadt Oldenburg ihn ausgesucht hat. Das ist natürlich der politische Analytiker, der politische Propagandist, so darf ich sagen, der politische Polemiker, der seit Jahrzehnten, genauso wie intensiv, wie er seine grammatischen Theorien betreibt, Politik betrieben hat und Politik analysiert hat. Dieser Chomsky soll hier selbstverständlich im Zentrum stehen und er soll so viel wie möglich zu Wort kommen. Wir wollen ihm dabei helfen und wir wollen den Versuch machen, auch dort, wo es nötig ist, Kontrapunkte zu setzen. Und wir in diesem Fall sind der, ja ich darf es mal so sagen, für die Stadt in die Rolle des Einladenden getreten. Das ist der Dekan der Fakultät 4, äh, Herr Professor Sunkale, der allerdings hier nicht in seiner Funktion als Dekan anwesend ist, sondern natürlich nur in seiner Funktion als Philosoph und als politischer Interessierter. Herzlich begrüßen möchte ich einen Vertreter eines maßgeblichen Mediums. Es war die Absicht, mehrere Medien, die auch vielleicht das nicht so überaus breite politische Spektrum der Medien und der Zeitungen in der Bundesrepublik hätten repräsentieren können, hier einzuladen. Es ist nur ein Vertreter gekommen. Es ist der Vertreter der Frankfurter Allgemeinen, Herr Dr. Michael Jeismann. Ganz herzlich willkommen. Herr Jeismann ist Redakteur des Feuilletons der FAZ und er ist im Leben Hauptstrich und Hauptberuf Historiker, habilitierter Historiker an der Universität Basel. Und dann darf das noch liest Michael Schiffmann. Michael Schiffmann ist einer der Übersetzer der Bücher von Noam Chomsky, die ja zum Glück zu einer großen Zahl und gerade nicht nur jene Bücher über die Grammatik, sondern eben auch jene Bücher über die Politik und die wesentlichen Etappen der Auseinandersetzung, die Chomsky geführt hat, sind ins Deutsche übersetzt worden und Herr Schiffmann hat nicht unwesentlich Anteil an dieser Übersetzungsarbeit. Auch Ihnen ein herzliches Willkommen. Was mich angeht, so sehe ich emeritierter Historiker. Emeritierter Historiker dieses Hauses dieser Fakultät, ich wollte Fachbereich sagen, dieser Fakultät heißt es natürlich. Und damit Schluss der zahlreichen einleitenden Worte und hinein in unser Abenteuer Denken und Leben und Diskutieren mit Noam Chomsky zu dem Thema, das Ihnen allen bekannt ist. Ich darf Herrn Chomsky natürlich einleitend äh, die, 
das ist ein Worterteil zu einer Reihe von Bemerkungen, Vorwegbemerkungen zu unserem Thema. from 1986, 
86, I gave many examples, and it's updated to the present with many more examples. Uh, what's interesting is that it doesn't matter how clear the facts are or how uncontroversial they are. We must keep to the propagandistic meaning. Terror is the way it's used. It's used to re refer to their terror against us, not our terror against them. And that's independent of who uses it. So uh, Japanese imperialists in uh, North Asia and Manchuria uh, described what they were doing as defending the population against the terror uh, of the uh, uh, Chinese bandits who were uh, 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 attacking the legitimate government and the population. Uh, the Nazis uh, condemned the terror of the partisans and they were defending the legitimate governments of the population against their terror. Uh, the, uh, and it's, as far as I know, it's universal. It's used by the United States too, and by other uh, well-behaved uh, countries uh, and their journals in referring to Western terror. That doesn't exist by definition. It's only the terror of the pirate that exists. And this is true no matter how clear the cases are. Uh, so uh, take, say, the uh, uh, completely uncontroversial case of the uh, U.S. war against Nicaragua conducted by the people who are now in power in Washington again. Uh, that one's uncontroversial. It came to the International Court of Justice, or the court uh, which condemned the United States for uh, international terrorism, uh, ordered it to terminate the crime and pay massive reparations. The U.S. government, including that's the people in power now, uh, responded by escalating the terror and officially directing it, officially directing it against uh, what they called soft targets, meaning undefended civilian targets. And it went on to become a horrendous terrorist war. The, uh, the war uh, after the World War, uh, no. 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 <laughs> uh, after the World Court, the U.S. rejected the World Court condemnation. Uh, Nicaragua brought it to the United Nations Security Council, where there were two resolutions, two successive resolutions, uh, affirming the court judgment and ordering all states to observe international law, the U.S. veto. Uh, so that's the end of that discussion. Uh, if anyone has any belief in uh, international law, the uh, International Court of Justice, the Security Council, and so on, then this is an uncontroversial case. But it's not counted in the annals of terrorism because it was the emperor, not the pirate. And the same is true of other examples. And so, for example, the U.S. Uh, terrorist war against Cuba, uh, which has been going on since the Kennedy administration, uh, and is still going on doesn't count in the annals of terror. It's very serious, but it doesn't count. Uh, the Kennedy administration, uh, its objective was to bring uh, the terrors of the earth to Cuba. The phrase is not mine. The phrase is from uh, historian uh, Arthur Schlesinger, a Kennedy advisor, a highly respected historian. Uh, this is in his biography of Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General. President's brother, who's, uh, who was assigned the responsibility for the terrorist war and took it as his highest priority to bring the terrors of the earth to Cuba. And they were very serious. In fact, it almost led to a nuclear war. And they continue until today, but it doesn't count. Uh, and the same is true of even minor cases, so, so small that you don't notice them. So, for example, uh, Clinton's uh, bombing of the Sudan in 1998. Uh, destroyed the, about half of the country's pharmaceutical supplies and uh, cer certainly led to casualties. Uh, Germany had an ambassador there. Uh, he went from the Sudan to Harvard University, where he was a fellow of the uh, major international relations center, and he published an article in the uh, Harvard International Review uh, on this topic in which he estimated the number of dead at several tens of thousands. Similar estimates have been given by the 
few other independent authorities didn't bother to discuss it, but killing several tens of thousands of people is not considered a terrorist act. Uh, if uh, Al-Qaeda blew up uh, half the uh, pharmaceutical supplies in any country that mattered, like say Germany or the United States or England and so on, that would be noticed uh, and it would be considered a terrorist act although it would be by no means as serious because the rich countries have been replenished their pharmaceutical supplies. And we can easily continue that long to go on. It's a long record. Uh, and if you check it, you'll find that the term terror is consistently used in the propagandistic sense, their terror against us, which is the norm for, through history, unfortunately. Well, without going on with this, the same is true of globalization and in fact of almost every other term. So there is a literal meaning of the term globalization. It means international integration. Uh, in particular, one particular form is international economic integration, uh, interchange, in economic interchange uh, among countries, uh, uh, trade, uh, export, and so on. Uh, that's globalization. But if we use the term in that sense, then probably the peak period of globalization was about a century ago. Uh, that is, if you look at cross-border interactions between countries relative to the size of the economy, the national economy, it probably peaked about a century ago. Uh, then it uh, declined between the two world wars and began to pick up again after the Second World War and has now probably reached approximately the level of the century ago. However, that's not the way the term is used. Uh, the term is used to refer to a specific form of international integration that was initiated by the United States and Britain and their allies uh, about 30 years ago, uh, which is a particular form of international integration uh, oriented towards the needs of investors of corporations, uh, banks, and so on, with the interests of people, uh, more or less, they're secondary or non-existent. Uh, the uh, uh, the, the uh, processes of globalization are formalized in what are called free trade. Uh, the, since the term is used that way, uh, people who are opposed to that specific form of international integration and who think that the priority ought to be the needs of people rather than private power, and they are called anti-globalization. They're opponents of globalization. And that's true in the propagandistic sense, but of course not in the literal sense. They're in favor of international integration. That's why they have international meetings in places like uh, Brazil and India and so on, uh, and call for international cooperation and solidarity and so on, but they're anti-globalization because they don't agree with the particular principles designed to ensure that the interests of investors and lenders and corporations are privileged and those of other people disregarded. So they're anti-globalization. And the power of propaganda is so enormous that they even accept the label. So they sometimes describe themselves as anti-globalization Although well, they're all in favor of globalization in the literal sense, just not this kind, or other kind. Uh, uh, and that's not unusual. Uh, this particular form of, I'll continue to use the term in the propagandistic sense because that's conventional. Everyone uses it that way, and I'll use it with reservations because we really shouldn't, and just as we shouldn't use terror just for the terror of the pirate and not the terror of the emperor. Uh, in the, so what's, uh, we, under, we know very well what's expected of globalization. Uh, the, uh, uh, the intelligence community of the United States, the CIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and others, uh, are working together with academic specialists, uh, put out the, uh, in the year 2000, uh, released a detailed uh, discussion of their expectations 
uh, for the next several decades. Uh, and some of them have to do with globalization. And they expected that globalization will continue uh, and that it will lead to, uh, now I'm quoting, increasing financial volatility and a widening economic divide. Uh, literal globalization would have the opposite consequence. Uh, economic theory predicts that literal globalization leads to a single market and a single price and a single wage. That's what economists prove theorems about. Uh, but this kind of globalization is expected to lead to financial growing, financial volatility, and a widening economic divide, the opposite. Uh, increasing financial volatility means lower growth, uh, harming most of the poor, uh, widening economic divide, is what that means. Uh, they also go on to predict that the widening economic divide will lead to deepening stagnation uh, anger, frustration, uh, uh, alienation, which will turn, which will in turn lead to violence and terror, uh, much of it directed against the United States, regarded as the source of the globalization process. Well, that's the prediction. Uh, war planners make the same predictions, and the justifications for the futuristic new weapon systems, such as weapons in space, uh, are explicitly that they will be needed because of the widening economic divide and growing frustration and anger and the need to control uh, the, what are called the have-nots, the people who don't have anything. Uh, well, those are the predictions for globalization in the technical sense, not in a non-literal sense. Uh, the uh, processes of so-called globalization are formalized in what are called free trade agreements. Uh, the term has only three defects. They're not free, it doesn't have to do with trade, and they're not agreements. Uh, <laughs> they're certainly not agreements if people are considered part of their country. Uh, they are opposed by the populations, and often overwhelmingly, just about everywhere, including the United States. There's a reason why they never, these agreements never come, enter the electoral arena and why they're not discussed in the media. The population is quite strongly opposed to them. And that's true almost every, uh, or at least where we can tell with polls and opinion and studies and so on. So they're not agreements if people are part of their countries. Uh, they are not about trade, uh, for sometimes they are, but mostly not. So, for example, a core element of the current uh, World Trade Organization negotiations has to do with the what's called the General Agreement on Trade and Services. Uh, there's a standard uh, joke among development economists that if something is officially has officially has the word trade in its title, it's not about trade, uh, and that's true of the General Agreement on Trade and Services. What that has to do with is not trade, but privatization, uh, with privatization of services. That means handing services into the hands of unaccountable private tyrannies, it's called corporations, that's what they are. Uh, what are services? Well, services are anything that a human being could be interested in. So for example, education, uh, health, uh, welfare, uh, school, uh, uh, water, the control of water, resources, uh, energy, anything that people could possibly be interested in, that's services. Uh, what is the effect of private, uh, privatizing services? Uh, very simple. It reduces the public arena to virtually nothing. Everything is in the hands of unaccountable private tyrannies. That means that it's possible to have formal democratic systems uh, which can operate but not do anything uh, because everything is out of public arena. Uh, and that's one of the major goals of contemporary globalization. Its core principle was liberalization of capital flow and deregulation of currencies. It was well understood that that is going to slow growth 
and development, which it did for the countries that followed the rules, but also that it's a major attack on democracy. The reason why the post-war economic system was based on capital control and regulated currencies was that John Maynard Keynes and his American counterpart, Harry Dexter White, understood uh, that if free capital flow is permitted, uh, governments will not be able to make policy. And that was understood by Adam Smith, uh, and the reasons are obvious. A uh, free flow of capital, uh, deregulated currencies means massive speculation. And of course, speculation increased astronomically after currencies were deregulated. A free flow of capital creates what's called a virtual parliament, which carries out a moment-by-moment -moment referendum on government policies. And if they don't like the government policies, they destroy the economy by capital flight, by tax on the currency, and so on. Uh, that renders democratic choice impossible. Uh, that's been understood for a long time, back in Adam Smith. Uh, and, uh, it, uh, and the logic is simple, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, exactly as predicted. In the countries that followed the rules, growth slowed and democracy formally functioned, but the choices within it narrowed because the choices are basically made by the international investment and lending community. They don't like the choices, it's where they come. And you can see the case after the case of this, this time we'll talk about. Uh, so they're not, they're not agreements, they're not about trade. And they're certainly not free. Uh, the, uh, uh, they include highly protectionist elements. So one core element of the World Trade Organization and the, all the free trade agreements is a guarantee of monopoly pricing rights to major corporations. Um, in the World Trade Organization, it's called the Trade-Related Intellectual Property Rights. It has nothing to do with trade. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, intellectual property. It has to do with monopoly pricing. It guarantees to major corporations the right to charge extraordinarily high prices without competition for a long time in advance. It's completely unprecedented. No developed society, currently developed society, ever tolerated anything like that. But it's imposed now to prevent other others from uh, achieving the same development. In the economics literature is called kicking away the ladder. Mm -hmm. The term comes from a few great economists, Friedrich Bliss, uh, who pointed out that uh, the actual road to development is state-directed uh, development. He was correct about that. And also added that once countries use it, they want to kick away the ladder so that others can't use it, which is correct. And the World Trade Organization is a perfect example. The, uh, uh, this, these monopoly pricing rules, just to give you an estimate, uh, ju just in the case of the United States alone, uh, and just the pharmaceutical industry alone, uh, grants gives them about $150 billion a year. Uh, and if you generalize that to other industries and other uh, uh, countries, of course, it's uh, astronomical. Uh, uh, and there are many other such, such exceptions that, that violate uh, any principle of free trade. So they're not, about, they're not free, they're not about trade, they're not agreements, but apart from that, they're free trade agreements. And, uh, and their main function, uh, understood, is to undermine democracy. Uh, that's true of liberalization of capital, it's true almost by definition of privatization, and it's true of the whole uh, collection of neoliberal mechanisms. Well, that's in the, but, but this is globalization in the propagandistic sense, and it's intended to, uh, uh, it's going to have the consequences, presumably, uh, that are predicted. Um, widening economic divide, slower growth, deepening stagnation, increased terror, uh, which will require violence from us, but that won't be terror, because what the emperor does is not terror, only what the pirate does. 
how that works done to us, and what we do to others. Well, the, these examples are quite typical. Um, pick your example, pick the case you're interested in, you'll find something similar. And one of the major tasks of the uh, intellectual culture and the media in particular is to keep to the propagandistic notions uh, and to, in general, shape our perception of the world uh, so that we don't see what's happening. Uh, uh, we may get facts, the data may be there, but within a framework that makes it almost impossible to understand, uh, that marginalizes people, that, uh, uh, that allows them to be more easily controlled, that, uh, removes them from exercising authentic power, and people know it. It's not that they are ignorant. They see it. So they take the United States, um, which is a very well-studied society. We know a lot about it. Public attitudes are well-known. In the last election, year 2000, uh, which is the last one, of course, for which we have a specific date, uh, before the election, uh, right before the election, about three quarters of the population regarded it as a farce. Uh, that's why the, the public didn't care uh, about all the exposés about uh, cheating in Florida and the Supreme Court and so on. There was a lot of uh, uproar about that, but it was limited to intellectuals, and the public just didn't react. Okay, so the election was stolen. It's a farce anyway. So who cares? Uh, the public, 75% of it, uh, before the election, so before any of this, considered the election to be, and all elections, to be some kind of a game uh, <clears throat> involving rich contributors, party bosses, and the public relations industry, which trains candidates to say meaningless things, uh, which you may be able to get votes, but prevent you from understanding their positions on any issue. <laughs> there is a measure in political science called issue awareness. How much do you know about the issues? It reached, it's been declining for years, and it reached its historic low in the year 2000. My guess is it will be even lower in the year 2004. Uh, and the reason is not because people are stupid. Uh, I don't have the patience to watch the presidential debates, but my wife does. <laughs> educated person and taught at Harvard Graduate School for 25 years, as opposed that's supposed to mean educated. Uh, she followed the debates. She simply could not understand where the candidates stood on the issue. And that's the purpose. The purpose is to, uh, the public relations industry is kind enough to tell us what they're doing. They say we have to emphasize not issues, but rather qualities. So is this person a leader? Can you trust him? Is he the kind of person you'd like to meet in a bar and have a drink with? Him? <laughs> is he the kind of person you hated in fourth grade because he was a snob? Those are the major issues in the year 2000 election, and it's similar in this election. And the public doesn't take it seriously, quite right. Uh, uh, and the same is true now. So there's a, the public is, in fact, aware of what's happening, but feels helpless about it. That's part of the purpose of propaganda, make people feel helpless. There's nothing they can do. Well, in fact, there's a lot they can do. They can do anything. That's a very, we're very free, we're very privileged, we have plenty of opportunities, and therefore it's necessary to work very hard to keep people from knowing what the issues are, uh, to uh, keep them from perceiving the way the world is uh, uh, developing and who's leading it and where, uh, and also to make them feel as if they can't do anything, uh, which is completely wrong. There is not only an understanding of this, but there's plenty of opposition, uh, in many ways unprecedented, including in the media, uh, where there are by now independent media, uh, what are called alternative media, uh, where there's uh, community-based radio, there's the use of the internet uh, extensively. Uh, there are now sources of news other than the Western powers for the first time. So a lot of our information about Iraq 
uh, and the Middle East is coming from the fact that there's an uncontrollable news source. Uh, the Arab news sources, Al Jazeera, uh, who are hated by every government in the region and are especially hated by the Western powers. Uh, the United States has been trying very hard uh, to get the Emir of Qatar to close down Al Jazeera, it's in Qatar. Uh, and that leads to some very comical incidents, I should say. The Emir of Qatar was in Washington about a year ago, and Colin Powell uh, was putting on tremendous pressure to shut down Al Jazeera, which is a nuisance. Uh, and the Emir, I suppose, as a joke, they gave a press conference in Washington, uh, where the press corps was there, but almost none of them reported it, in which he gave a kind of an ironic lecture to the Washington press corps, uh, explaining to them that we have this notion of freedom of the press. We don't like what the Al Jazeera is saying, nevertheless, we're going to allow them to keep reporting. Well, the press was kind enough to barely report that. Uh, but they are there, and have satellite camera on. And a lot of news comes that they don't have embedded reporters. <laughs> so in many ways, there, there are alternatives. And uh, they're growing, and they're being used on the, the basis for, uh, for example, for international organizing, these so-called anti-globalization movements, meaning those who want a different form of international integration rely extensively on internet communication for uh, information because they can't get it in the media, uh, for uh, communication, for interaction, organization. Uh, and all of these uh, popular movements are growing at an enormous level. Uh, how successful they'll be, well, you know, it's really a matter of choice, so they not prediction. Ich denke aber auch, dass viele von Ihnen darüber hinausgehende oder daneben stehende oder in eine andere Richtung führende Fragen haben. Ich würde damit zunächst einfach mal meine Partner hier auf dem Podium bitten, ja, ich denke, Kommentare zu geben, vor allen Dingen aber auch Fragen an Herrn Chomsky zu stellen. Ich persönlich meine, um auch gleich wieder Gelegenheit zu haben, weiter zuhören zu können. Wer bitte Herr Zitat. Zunächst einmal haben Sie herzlichen Dank für Ihre Ausführungen. Ich möchte äh, keine besonderen Kommentare abgeben, sondern mehr Fragen an Sie stellen und äh, hoffe, dass Sie äh, diese äh, verstehen. Zunächst einmal, ja. Zunächst einmal möchte ich äh, über Herrn sprechen, so wie Sie, und äh, Sie fragen, das ist mir auch bei der Lektüre Ihrer Werke aufgefallen. Ähm, mir ist aufgefallen, dass äh, Sie sehr viel kritisieren äh, am Menschen und man sieht sehr klar die negativen Strukturen des Menschen, zumal wenn er Macht hat. Was mich interessiert wäre, was ist eigentlich Ihr Menschenbild? Wie ist der Mensch, dass er diese Strukturen aufbaut, die Sie kritisieren. Und was sagen Sie zu solchen Leuten wie Kasimachus in Platons Staat, im ersten Buch, der sagt, Recht ist, was den Stärkeren nützt. Oder Machiavelli, der sagt, die Menschen sind schlecht. Oder Hobbes, der sagt, der Mensch tut alles mit Gewalt. Oder Baudin, der sagt, alle Staatsordnung gründet sich auf Gewalt. Es würde mich interessieren, wie Sie 
wenn Sie Präsident wären von den Vereinigten Staaten, reagieren würden, wie Sie versuchen würden, das Rad umzudrehen und Ihr Menschenbild äh, zu materialisieren. Das ist das eine. Das zweite, was ich Nuance. 
but it gives a nuanced argument for markets. And the core of it is, he claims, you could question the argument, but the argument is that under conditions of perfect liberty, markets will tend towards perfect equality, and therefore they're good, as distinct from globalization, which is expected to lead to a widening economic divide. Uh, Adam Smith, incidentally, also strongly opposed neoliberal globalization. Uh, very few people bothered to notice that his phrase, invisible hand, which is used once in Wealth of Nations, comes in a, in the, as part of an argument against free capital movement and against imports. He says these would be very destructive to England, uh, but because of their sympathy and concern for local people, uh, English investors uh, will prefer to invest at home and to use products made at home. So therefore, as if by an invisible hand, we will be protected from the ravages of the market under neoliberal principles. It's exactly the opposite of what everyone claims, but look it up. Uh, so that's Adam Smith and David Hume. Bill Humboldt's view of human beings was that the core of their nature is the desire to uh, inquire and create. And if we take away, if we infringe on a person's right uh, to do that, we're infringing on his human character. So for example, he says that if, a, if an artisan creates a beautiful object on command, we admire what he did, but we despise who he is. Uh, a tool in a system of command and control. And that's a standard enlightenment view. And so those are, uh, those are also reasonable, I think, perceptions of human nature. It's true that the other aspects also exist. And depending on what institutions are created, and what structures of power there are, one or another aspect of human nature will uh, 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 will become dominant. And so, for example, if we had no method of controlling uh, violent criminals, uh, the society would soon be run by pathological maniacs. Uh, that doesn't mean that that's the only characteristic that humans have. It's that the institutions would have been designed to permit that outcome. Well, we have designed an institutions which are in many ways pathological and may destroy the species and the possibility for peace of life for future generations, but that's within our control. But we can also follow the path suggested by Aristotle, Adam Smith, David Hume, Humboldt, and others. They're also talking about the parts of human nature. And what would I do if I was elected president? Well, I know what my first act would be. And my first act would be to set up a war crimes tribunal uh, to try me for the crimes I'm probably going to commit. For the same reasons. And then if we go to specific cases, well, there's plenty of things we can do. So take, say, the terror of the pirate. Um, what's called terror. If, if you look at intelligence agencies, uh, analysts of uh, terrorism and so on, there's a very broad consensus on how to increase terror and how to reduce terror. But the way to increase terror is by violence. Uh, that uh, helps the terrorists mobilize the constituency that they're trying to reach. Uh, so it's a gift. Uh, if you want to reduce terror, uh, the terrorists themselves are criminals. Okay, carrying out crimes. So you approach it as a police problem. That uh, reduces terror, and it works. There have been considerable successes in Europe, and South Asia, and elsewhere in breaking up terrorist networks through police work. There's also success in expanding by violence. That's helped enormously. Uh, but more important than that is the constituency that they're trying to mobilize, big constituency. These may be people who hate them and fear them, but nevertheless perceive them as fighting for a cause that is right and just. And if you carry out 
act of violence, that helps them convince the constituency that they're right and they have to resort to violence. On the other hand, if you pay attention to the grievances of the constituency, which are often quite legitimate uh, and should be attended to, whether it leads to terror or not, if you pay attention to the grievances, you reduce the appeal of the terrorists to the mass constituency. And that works. Uh, there are case after case of that. Take, say, the British in Northern Ireland, recent case. As long as Britain responded to IRA terror, which was serious, as long as they responded to it by violence, it was a gift to the IRA. It helped them mobilize the constituency and it increased terror. When they finally understood that there are legitimate grievances and they ought to pay some attention to them, that reduced the threat of terror and uh, essentially eliminated the IRA. Uh, today, Northern Ireland isn't utopia, but it's a far better place than it was, uh, say, 10 years ago. I visited it and it was a, a horror story. And the difference is uh, the obvious uh, approach. Uh, treat the terrorists as criminals, uh, treat their constituent, the constituency they're trying to mobilize as people with serious grievances, uh, which should be uh, attended to. And, and that works. Uh, you, I should say that every, I think every single former uh, head of Israeli military intelligence and of the general security services in Israel has said pretty much the same thing in their own context. And I suspect that if you were to ask German intelligence, they play the same thing too. Uh, it is a very general consensus. It's very sensible. And uh, the chief executive of the United States has that choice. They can choose to increase terror, as they do, or to reduce it, as they do not. And so for example, the invasion of Iraq was predicted, was predicted by intelligence agencies and independent specialists that it would increase the threat of terror, which is exactly what it did quite considerably. Uh, and uh, the next similar act will increase it again. Uh, I just finally, the, uh, the Al-Qaeda phenomenon and Osama bin Laden were virtually created by Clinton's bombing of the Sudan and Afghanistan in 1998. Before that, they were unknown. They were kind of vaguely known, but not considered important. In the U.S. intelligence records, there wasn't even any mention of the uh, okay, until 1998. But the bombings were a gift. They increased significantly the uh, popular support for uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, their financing, recruitment, uh, and they made bin Laden a great symbol uh, uh, with a lot of appeal. Uh, and they also led to close relations between bin Laden and the Taliban which previous, previously had been quite hostile. So they had the expected effect, and that's true in case after case. Uh, this is one problem, that there are way, known ways to deal with, uh, but it depends on your objectives. Was mich in diesem Zusammenhang besonders interessiert, ist die Rolle des Staates, um die gelegentlich Antiken wirklich ganz klar auszuführen. Ich habe so den Eindruck, dass in den letzten fünf, sechs Jahren der Staat als öffentliche Institution einen gewissen Imagewandel durchgemacht hat, von einer sagen wir, äh, Verteilungsorganisation bis hin zu einem ja, Unterdrückerstaat, jetzt wieder mehr hin zu einer sozusagen sozial-utopischen Veranstaltung, äh, die letztlich Effekte eindämmen soll, die äh, durch diese Globalisierung äh, der, der Ökonomien, durch, den, durch die Liberalisierung der 
Finanzströme zustande gekommen. Ähm, wenn man das zusammenbringt mit dem Begriff des Terrors, dann kommt man aber schnell dahin, dass die modernen Nationalstaaten selbst ganz eng mit Terror verbunden sind. Also Terror, ja, Terror äh, war eben gewissermaßen auch Begleit, Begleiterin der äh, Geburtsstunde der Französischen Republik, genauso wie äh, in Deutschland äh, die Nationalbewegung zunächst durch Terror auf sich aufmerksam gemacht hat. So würde ich gerne wissen, wenn der Staat also in seiner Geburt, der moderne Nationalstaat, auch der Wohlfahrtsstaat, in seiner Geburtsstunde äh, von Terror, von eigenem Terror begleitet war, wie würden Sie begründen, dass der Staat, wenn er nur gewissermaßen anders gelenkt würde, wenn er in andere Hände käme, äh, wie würden Sie begründen, dass der ähm, also letztlich doch eine Hoffnung sein kann, ähm, die also zumindest die absoluten Wildwüchse einer, einer delirierenden Weltwirtschaft einzudämmen. Anders gefragt, klassische Frage gewissermaßen, äh, gibt es nicht vielleicht einen dritten Weg zwischen sozusagen einer total liberalisierten Gesellschaft und einer eben doch mehr ein bisschen nostalgisch äh, sich dem Wohlfahrtsstaat zuneigenden Gesellschaft? Gibt es irgendwas dazwischen? Ähm, was also sozusagen, das scheint mir nicht an ihrer Utopie zu sein, den Dingen ihren Platz zu weisen, zu weisen äh, den sie haben müssten. Also der Ökonomie, die ökonomische Sphäre, aber der Politik eben noch ihre eigene politische Sphäre. Und, und wenn ich sie richtig verstanden habe, ist die offenbar verloren gegangen. Aber da wüsste ich gerne mehr von Ihnen. Great topic, but for long lecture. Uh, the reason I'm an anarchist is uh, because it just seems to me self-evident that that's what a human being should be. Uh, when I began learning about it, uh, the basic theme of anarchism is in fact expressed by people like uh, von Humboldt and others. It's the core of classical liberalism. It came to a, an end pretty much in the mainstream with the rise of capitalism, uh, but it still continues in libertarian movements and thought. And here I use the word libertarian in the traditional European sense, not the Anglo-American sense, which is quite different. Uh, the, uh, The basic theme is that any structure of authority and domination has to carry, uh, has to face a challenge. It has to prove its legitimacy. If it, cannot, if it can prove its legitimacy, you accept it. If it cannot prove its legitimacy, which is almost always, Uh, you move to dismantle it. And that's true whether it's uh, in relations internal to patriarchal families or up to international societies. Uh, sometimes structures of authority can, I think, be justified. So if I'm walking in the street with my granddaughter and she runs into the street and I grab her hand and pull her back, uh, that's a relation of authority. Uh, but I think we can all give a sensible justification for it. And sometimes that's true. Uh, most of the time it isn't. Uh, and uh, anarchism is just a commitment to uh, try to identify structures of authority, which we often do not see. It's hard, to, it's hard to perceive them because of habits of submission and so on. And if we perceive them, then to move to dismantle them. Uh, that's anarchism. As for the Nation state, I agree with you, who was born through terror. And I think it's a horrifying institution. Uh, there's a reason why Europe was the most savage and brutal part of the world for centuries. Uh, there was an effort to impose nation states. And those are constructions that simply do not relate to people's cultures, needs, associations, uh, languages, and so on. Uh, and therefore, it led to centuries of extraordinary violence. Uh, it only came to an end in 1945, because by then, the means of destruction that had been created were so 
overwhelming uh, that the Europeans realized that they just cannot play the game anymore. The next time French and Germans uh, decide to slaughter one another, it will be the end for everybody. So that's over. Uh, now you have to keep the structures that have been imposed by violence. Uh, as Europe, one of the reasons Europe conquered the world was that it was such a violent place. It had developed a culture of violence and also means of violence that enabled it to conquer most of the world, where it also attempted to impose nation states. Uh, I count in Europe here, the United States and Australia and so on. Now, the United States and Australia has solved the problem of creating a nation state very easily, namely by essentially uh, exterminating the indigenous population. Okay. Then there's no internal problems anymore. Uh, but uh, so they don't have internal conflict. Uh, but elsewhere in the world, uh, the European plague of nation states was spread always with violence. If you look at the current horrible wars going on in the world today, and there are many of them, to a large extent, not entirely, but to a large extent, they are the residue of European efforts to impose nation-state structures on societies uh, where it just doesn't fit, which is just about everywhere. Uh, it just does not accord with human needs, relationships, associations, conditions, and so on. I might add as a personal comment that, uh, that right at the moment I'm under investigation by the Turkish state security services because in Diyarbakir in southeastern Turkey, I gave a talk, uh, Kurdish area of Turkey, in which I said something nice about the Ottoman Empire. And that leads to the charge of separatism. Uh, what I said about the Ottoman Empire, and I believe it, uh, is that, of course, nobody wants to restore the Ottoman Empire. But to some extent, it had the right idea. It left people alone. So the, in a particular area, the Greeks would run Greek affairs, and the Armenians would run Armenian affairs, and they sort of got along with each other, and you could go from uh, uh, Istanbul to Cairo without passing a border point, and it kind of flew it. But partly it was a result of the extreme corruption of the caliphate, and corruption is not a bad thing in many respects. It depends on weak of the power. Uh, it's much worse than a corrupt ruler is a Hitler a non-corrupt ruler who's just savage and brutal and wants power. That's the real danger. But if you have corruption, it tends to weaken power, and the caliphate was extremely corrupt, so it did more or less leave people alone. And if you look at the region, you know, that whole region, that's the right kind of organization for uh, imposition of nation states is brutal, harsh, and uh, violent, and it's leading to tremendous conflicts. So the long-term alternative to the nation state, in my opinion, is to dissolve it. I think it's a rotten institution, a horrible history. But we're stuck with it now. We can't just say goodbye. Uh, but I think we should look forward to dissolving it. And that uh, has to do with this third way. I mean, it does exist. And we have the, pro the immediate problem, which is within our hands, of what kind of a nation state to make it. Do we want to make it the kind that Aristotle wanted? You know, a, a welfare state democracy. You know, Aristotle, I agree that that's probably the best solution. He was, of course, talking about cities, not nation states. But for nation states, yes, that's the best short-term solution. But the best longer-term solution is to dissolve them in favor of the uh, real popular democracy. That means popular control of everything. The workplace, the community, the uh, then developing associations with one another through voluntary interaction uh, up to the level of the international economy. And here we should not uh, uh, elude ourselves into thinking that the international economy is liberalized. That's the term that's used. But Adam Smith would turn over his grave to see the way 
um, his name is being used. Not a single thing that's happening is liberal in the sense of classical liberalism. It's, it's, the states are indeed, as you say, moving from a former period of commitment to some level of distribution towards commitment to uh, supporting uh, narrow centers of power and privilege. That's a crucial part of breaking down the post-war economic arrangements, the early post-war economic arrangements, including control of capital and uh, uh, control of currencies, were designed specific, specifically to allow governments to respond to overwhelming popular feelings after the Second World War uh, for a more just society. And after the destruction of fascism and the dissolution of European empires, there was a period of great hope all over the world. I mean, Europe and the United States and industrial countries, it led to demands for a more decent and just society, which meant uh, social democratic policies, welfare state policies, uh, substantial growth, and that's what the post-war system was designed to achieve, and it worked within the bounds of the earth. So the highest period of economic growth in world history was from roughly 1950 to the early 1970s, and it was relatively egalitarian growth. So in the United States, which is the least egalitarian of the industrial societies, and has the weakest welfare state, but even in the United States, the lowest quintile, the lowest 20%, actually grew faster than the highest 20% since the neoliberal period. It's radically the opposite, and that's true just about everywhere. Uh, so the international side is not, uh, not liberalized. Uh, let's just take that, I won't go too long, but one more word about that. Uh, take this notion of trade. Uh, what's called trade would certainly not have been called trade by any classical liberal. Uh, so take, say, the best studied case, North America. There is a North American free trade agreement, uh, and one of its great glories is supposed to be that it increased trade between the United States and Mexico. Well, it did increase cross-border interact transactions, but not trade. Uh, if you take a look at the cross-border transactions, uh, they are mostly internal to huge command economies. Uh, corporations. So before the agreement, the NAFTA, the National North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, the proportion internal of cross-border movement of goods, internal to command economies, was about 50 percent. Now it's risen to about two thirds. Now imagine that you're Adam Smith and you see General Motors that producing parks in Indiana and sending them to northern Mexico to be assembled because you can get cheaper labor and you don't have to have paid benefits and you can pollute the environment and so on, and then sending them back to New York to sell as cars. I mean, would Adam Smith call that trade? It's no more trade than if the Kremlin moved goods from you know, Leningrad to Warsaw to be assembled and sent back to Kiev to be sold. It's not trade. That's interactions within huge command economies, huge territories. And that's probably true of most of the so-called world trade. It's kind of hard to measure. But if you look at it, nobody really looks at it carefully. But if you try to uh, identify real trade, you know, authentic trade, it's very likely that it's declined during the neoliberal period. Uh, all of these terms and concepts are used in such a distorted sense that you really have to decode from the beginning to get an understanding of what's happening. Uh, so the economy is not liberalized, and I quite agree with you that welfare states are not the answer. They, I think, are the short-term answer, but the longer-term answer is to recognize that this whole concept of nation-states is just a savage, destructive concept and should be dissolved in terms of any more humane terms.
Lernen gibt es für Historiker beträchtlich. Also Humboldt als Anarchist, der unser berühmter Universitätsgründer, ein Loblied auf den orientalischen Despotismus. Adam Smith sind wir hier zitiert als Karl Marx, überhaupt nur als Karl Marx. Ja, und dann auch als Frage- und Prüfungstechnik, wenn du nach Plato gefragt wirst, kannst du auch mit Aristoteles antworten. Ich habe ich den Zeitpunkt, habe den Zeitpunkt erreicht, wo wir verabredungsgemäß in das Publikum hinein wollen, aber ich habe noch, bevor wir das tun, ich habe schon eine Wortmeldung darüber gesprochen. Denn die erste Wortmeldung aus dem Publikum ist immer am schwersten zu bekommen und sie nicht vor, aber vorher würde ich doch gerne dem Übersetzer von Herrn äh, äh, ja. <lacht> Wir hatten es ja auch davon, dass das, was Globalisierung genannt wird, nicht eigentlich Globalisierung ist. Und ich möchte jetzt eine dritte Verschiebung einfach als Anregung einbringen. Ich habe nämlich auch gesehen, dass es schon die ersten Wortmeldungen gibt. Und das ist meines Erachtens mit der eigentliche Hauptsinn solcher Veranstaltungen, dass der Dialog mit dem Publikum zustande kommt. Und nicht, dass Leute, die sowieso immer reden, dann eben auch weitere Reden dazu führen. Die Anmerkung, die ich äh, zu machen habe, ist folgende. Ich habe am Ende von meiner Laudatio auf Noam Chomsky schon eine gewisse Befürchtung ausgesprochen, nämlich, dass er so hoch auf ein Podest gelobt wird, dass äh, er der eigenen Realität, die wir hier vor Augen haben und die wir verändern müssen, dass er der entschwebt. Und ohne mich selber jetzt als äh, Vorbild hinstellen zu wollen, wenn ich ein Buch herausgebe von Norm Chomsky und dann ein Nachwort oder ein Vorwort schreibe, dann schreibe ich in der Regel zweieinhalb Seiten über Chomsky und äh, fünf oder zehn Seiten über Deutschland. Und äh, ich denke, wenn wir hier weiter diskutieren, dann äh, ist das vielleicht ein Aspekt, der auch ins Spiel gebracht werden sollte. Denn solche Dinge wie, dass der Reallohn äh, der Mehrheit der Bevölkerung stagniert oder sinkt, und dass es immer größere Unsicherheit gibt, dass die Reichen immer reicher werden, dass es soziale Speicherungen gibt und so weiter, äh, passieren ja auch Überraschungen nicht etwa nur in Amerika, sondern auch in Europa, auch sogar in Deutschland und äh, wie man hört, sogar in Oldenburg. <lacht> und äh, darüber nachzudenken, was er uns zu sagen hat, dann äh, sollten wir das wirklich in der Form machen, dass wir versuchen, das für uns selbst tatsächlich äh, zunutze zu machen, anstatt intellektuellen Eskapismus zu betreiben. Und, äh, über bestimmte andere Formen der Unterdrückung zu reden, die anderswo sind und nicht die eigentlich Wichtigen, nämlich diejenigen, die uns selbst betreffen und diejenigen, wo wir selbst was tun können, um was dran zu verändern. Jetzt weiß ich nicht, Frau... Aha, so läuft das gut. Ich habe keine sicheren Informationen, wie das mit dem Saal wirklich ist. Die werden also herumgetragen, die stehen nicht irgendwo, sondern werden herumgetragen. Das ist natürlich ein bisschen Zeit in Anspruch, das lässt sich nicht ändern. In der Schule heute Morgen standen einfach vorne zwei oder drei Mikrofone und die Redner konnten dann reden, die erscheinen mindestens eben ein paar Stunden, um zu sagen, wie dieses Tongerät da zu bedienen. Bitte schön. Sie sagen, wer Sie sind und äh, Sie dürfen Deutsch oder Englisch sprechen, das ist völlig leicht. Ich versuche es in Deutsch. Äh, mein Name ist Ulrich äh, Ruschig. Ich bin Hochschullehrer für Philosophie an dieser Universität. Ähm, ich will auch den Versuch machen, äh, das zurückzufinden äh, in die Bundesrepublik äh, und 
Mir ist da eingefallen, dass ich gestern äh, eine Rede äh, eines gerade gewählten Präsidenten gehört habe, der äh, den Begriff äh, Globalisierung affirmativ verwendet hat, und zwar genau in dem Sinne, äh, wie Herr Chomsky das gemacht hat, nämlich als Propagandabegriff. Das heißt also, der Begriff Globalisierung wird einfach so verwendet und es wird nur noch die Frage gestellt, wie, verhaltet, wie verhält sich, oder das sagt natürlich der, der, der neu gewählte Präsident, wie müssen sich die Menschen hier verhalten, damit sie in dieser Globalisierung richtig aufgestellt sind und möglichst viele Vorteile davon haben. Jetzt haben wir die Gegenrede gehört, auch mit viel Beifall, gestern gab es auch Beifall, die Gegenrede, die heißt, von einem solchen Begriff Globalisierung muss man die Finger weglassen, weil Globalisierung selbst ein Gewaltbegriff ist. Das heißt also, die Gewalt verbirgt, die hinter dieser Globalisierung steckt. Soweit stimme ich dem äh, Vortrag zu und sage, äh, es ist die Aufgabe des Intellektuellen, äh, genau das zu sagen, dass diese Begriffe, so wie sie sind, nichts anderes sind als Schiffen für Gewalt und Durchsetzung von Gewalt. Die andere Frage ist, in dem Vortrag auf eine, eine äh, äh, gestellte Frage, Ihr Begriff von Demokratisierung. Äh, Sie haben den vielleicht mit Humboldt und vielleicht äh, sozusagen an, an das, was im Positiven anarchistisch in jedem Menschen ist, äh, äh, gebunden und gesagt, Demokratisierung, und da gab es auch Beifall dafür, das ist eigentlich ein Gegenkonzept. Jetzt ist die Frage, wie verhält sich das zu dieser Globalisierung und diese Demokratisierung? Sie wissen ja, dass Globalisierung ja nicht so geht, dass es gemacht ist von Menschen, sondern Globalisierung geht über juristische Personen. Das sind ja keine Menschen mehr, das sind 18 Gesellschaften. Das, ist, das sind anonyme Mächte, die selber gar nicht mehr einbindbar sind, die nicht mehr einbindbar sind durch das, durch Menschen mit Fleisch und Blut, sondern das sind Mächte. Und da denke ich, dass ihr sozusagen ihre Antwort zu schwach ist. Also zu schwach, weil sie dieses Verhältnis, also was heißt denn das? Und zwar, was heißt das in den Vereinigten Staaten oder meinetwegen auch hier in Deutschland? Was heißt das? Angesichts dieser auf juristischen Personen, auf die Akkumulation von, von Kapital zielenden abstrakten Mechanismen, wie wollen Sie, wie wollen Sie da sagen, dass die Menschen mit Fleisch und Blut in dieses sozusagen entgegensetzen, weil Demokratie normalerweise ist es ja so, dass das gesagt wird, Globalisierung ist ja nichts anderes als die weltweite Verbreitung der Demokratie auf diesem Globus. Und wenn, das, das funktioniert ja nicht. Also, äh, kurz, kurz meine Frage. Die Aufregung. I, I agree with you that the, what is called globalization uh, standardly does lead to violence, uh, it does Uh, lend power to abstract entities, uh, legal entities like corporations, uh, and does undermine democracy. Uh, but that's the specific form of neoliberal globalization that is called globalization in the propaganda system. If we use the term globalization in its neutral sense, in its literal sense, as we should, just international integration, Then the question is, what form should it take? It doesn't have to take this form. You're quite right that this is the form it takes. Uh, but I don't think that the response to that is too weak. The response should be to change the form that international integration takes. And that is the goal of the so-called anti-globalization movement. They want a democratic international system. About corporations, you're exactly right. Uh, corporations, in fact, if you look at the history of corporations, uh, they were created not by people. Uh, they were not voted for. Uh, it, I know England and the United States, I presume it's the same in Germany, 
And they were created by courts and lawyers uh, without popular knowledge. Uh, the, about a century ago in England and the United States, uh, corporate entities were assigned the rights of persons. Okay, they were assigned the rights of persons, meaning freedom of speech, uh, freedom from uh, English terms, search and seizure, you can't look into what they're doing, you have the privacy of your home. Uh, they are immortal persons. Uh, they very quickly, uh, 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 this itself, I go on, was a tremendous blow against liberal principles. Uh, classical, there were liberals at the time. The term is still used, but it you know, exists. Uh, liberals at the time, you know, conservatives sometimes called, bitterly condemned these steps as what they called a move towards communism. They regarded it as the same as communism, and that's not completely wrong. Uh, they, this is just another form of totalitarianism. Fascism, Bolshevism, and corporations are the three kinds of totalitarianism that emerged in the 20th century. And they have rather similar roots. Their roots are in uh, neo-Hegelian ideas, late 19th century ideas, of, about the organic rights of entities uh, over and above uh, 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 over and above individuals, and a basic attack on liberal conceptions. And uh, uh, after having, and, and their future history is rather similar to the history of uh, Bolshevism. So the courts at first granted them the rights of persons, which is already out, utterly outrageous, uh, then uh, transferred those rights of personhood not to the abstract entity, but to the management. Okay. Uh, and that's just what happened with the history of Bolshevism. In fact, it happened because the, those are Leninist principles. Uh, it's not the uh, dictator, it's not the proletariat that's supposed to rule. It's the vanguard party that's supposed to rule. And within the vanguard party, it's the central committee. And within the central committee, it's the maximum leader. That's traditional Leninist theory. And that's precisely why it was condemned by Rosa Luxemburg, by actually Trotsky in his early years before he joined it, and by uh, Anton Panikuk, the leading uh, left Marxist, uh, and so on. It was regarded as a form of totalitarianism or threat. Uh, well, corporations went through the same evolution. The power was assigned to the management and ultimately to the uh, maximal leader, the CEO, the chief executive officer. Uh, meanwhile, the courts determined the core Anglo-American corporate law is that these persons must be pathological. They must be the kind of persons who we would put in a mental institution if they were flesh and blood. They must necessarily be concerned only with maximizing power and profit. Now that list was a famous court case in the United States about 90 years ago. Uh, it had to do with uh, the Ford Motor Company. Henry Ford was a kind of old-fashioned capitalist. And he thought uh, you should make cheap cars and pay high wages. That's good for people. Uh, some of his shareholders had brought him to court for that. The Dodge Brothers, who later, they wanted to use the profits to set up their own motor company, which was the Dodge Motor Company, lately taken over by uh, Daimler. It's, it's, it's just now German owned. Yeah, okay. Uh, but the courts decided that the Dodge Brothers were correct, that Ford could not pay higher wages and could not make better cars because his responsibility was to maximize the power and profit of this abstract entity that it created. In the new trade agreement, what are called trade agreements, uh, these monstrous pathological entities are given rights far beyond human beings. So if General Motors moves to Mexico, it can demand and must receive what's called national treatment. It must be treated like a Mexican company. If a Mexican goes to New York, 
of flesh and blood and says, I'd like national treatment. Mm. He'll be lucky if he's sent back to Mexico. He'll be lucky if he's up in Guantanamo. These pathological created entities uh, are, have rights vastly beyond the people, apart from which they're enormous, bigger states, uh, immortal, uh, and uh, utterly destructive. I mean, it's part of their nature to destroy the environment, uh, to destroy the possibility for life, uh, and any your right that the current form of so-called globalization privileges them. But that's just one of the many reasons why it's wrong. It should be eliminated along with these monstrous entities, which have no more legitimacy than Bolshevism or fascism. And yes, they should be eliminated. They should be taken over by popular control. Uh -huh. It's a core principle of democracy, and for that matter, classical liberalism. first 
phase uh, education, which includes self-education. It involves organization, which means interacting with other people, relying on everyone's natural instincts of sympathy and solidarity, uh, finding actions that, which can't be told by anyone. They depend on circumstances and goals and everything else. Uh, and uh, uh, ultimately achieving results. That, that's why we don't have slavery. That's uh, why we don't have kings and princes. Uh, that's why there's uh, women's rights that have come to be realized to a certain extent, but there's a long way to go. Uh, that's why we have parliamentary democracies, which we once had. Uh, and uh, that's why we have the uh, uh, unusual, uh, historically, the unique uh, legacy of freedom and privilege. It was not given as a gift. It was won by struggle, including struggle by young people, in the only ways that are possible. It's never going to be easy. Uh, it's easier now than it's ever been in the past because we just have more privilege and freedom. And uh, after that, it's a matter of choice. Before I start, I would like to object to the view that the lawyer is such as for the human being. My name is Dr. Schiff, I'm professor for European Economic Law, and I would like to come back to Aristotle, which is not my subject, <laughs> but writing on the welfare state principle in the German constitution, I got into a dispute with the older colleague from whom I took this commentary. He said, with your root being rooted in equality law, you will never be able to write something sensible on the welfare state principle. And listening to your views on Aristotle, I thought, hmm, maybe that's the reason. Maybe Michael Kittner is right, after all, because you said Aristotle chose to institute democracy and to institute egalitarian democracy. However, Aristotle had a peculiar view of equality. Mm -hmm. One of the other side, the only side I know of him, <laughs> is law is equality, and that's true, but only for equals, and law is inequality. That's true at all, as all well, as well, but only for unequals. And so this is, to me, the principle on which the welfare city principle, which later developed in the welfare nation state principle, is rooted on an exclusionary society to the outside, welfare for the Greeks, welfare for the Germans, and a stratified society in the inside, no equality for women, minorities, whatever. So the problem is, how do we translate this welfare state principle, which is indeed needed to have democracy, how do we translate this to international society, which is ruled by popular democracy? That's still a little to me, maybe you can help me solve it. Uh, I'm just using this as an ample uh, the, uh, I mean, you're perfectly right. Uh, Aristotle called for democracy for free men in Athens. That means not women and not slaves, and not non-Athenians, and that's correct. They restored the, fa the traditional fascist structures and tried to undermine the workers' movements and the resistance, and they did pretty much the same throughout Europe, and goes on in Italy, and at least in the 70s when our records came. Uh, as, as, for, as for praise for the Ottoman Empire, I mean, I, th I think you misunderstood the joke. Uh, there was no praise for Oriental despotism. What I said is that there was, we obviously don't want to restore the Ottoman Empire, but there was something right about it. And I think that's true. What was right about it was it left people alone. Doesn't mean there weren't lots of things wrong about it. Yeah, of course, nobody wants to restore it. Uh, as for the court martial, would I serve as a judge? Uh, uh, that is, the answer to that, to be brief, is no. And asked, and I said I wouldn't. Uh, but it has nothing to do with the court martial. I mean, the court martial is a, an educational device. It's not going to try anybody. It's an educational device. Uh, is it a way of getting people to understand things better about how the world works? Well, no, that's a matter of judgment. But uh, ever since I was asked to be on the Russell Tribunal, I've felt that it's probably not an effective educational device and that I could probably spend my time and energy more effectively in other ways. 
Uh, but, you know, it's a judgment. Maybe your judgment is right. I wouldn't argue for mine. But that's been mine for many years. Uh, I should finally say that I would be wary about using the Nuremberg precedent. The reason is that Nuremberg was entirely unprincipled. I mean, the people who were sentenced at Nuremberg are maybe the worst criminals in the history of the world. But remember the Nuremberg principle. The Nuremberg trials define war crime and crime against humanity. And it was defined quite explicitly. It's a crime that you carried out and we didn't. And that was explicit. So for example, urban bombing of uh, civilian targets, uh, which was a horrendous crime here too, but particularly in Japan, uh, that was not called a war crime for the very explicit reason that the Allies did more of it uh, uh, than the uh, Axis. Mm -hmm. uh, defendants at Nuremberg were set free, literally, if they could bring an American counterpart to say we did the same crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take a look at the whole Nuremberg, the whole series of tribunals from Nuremberg to the present, there's not a single case in which one of the victors was on trial. Is it that the victors didn't commit crimes? I mean, it's just beyond absurdity. Uh, but the point is, these are crimes of the defeated. Mm -hmm. And that is not a, a principle that we should uh, adhere to. Uh, we should talk about crimes, uh, whether you have to win or you have to lose. Uh, so I'd really be cautious about even uh, using the Nuremberg precedent. Uh, as to the symbolic war crimes trials, yeah, I think they make sense. And after that, it's a matter of judgment as to where you want to put your energies. Oh. Mm -hmm. I did, I did. I just one word of the oder beziehungsweise Kritiker der Globalisierung nicht abdrücken, also da kann ich nur sagen, das stimmt nicht. Die FAZ hat zum Beispiel auch in Dadi Reu nicht nur einmal, sondern mehrfach gedruckt. Und dagegen, dagegen ist Herr Schomsky doch akademisch müde, wenn ich das sagen darf. Und äh, vielleicht liegt es aber auch daran, muss ich sagen, dass die, die Welt doch etwas komplizierter ist. Wenn Sie äh, zum Beispiel die World Trade Organisation ansprechen, Herr Chomsky. Tja, ähm, wissen Sie, es gibt doch einen guten amerikanischen Spruch, der heißt, you can fool some people sometimes, but you can't fool all the people all the time. So, bitte erklären Sie mir, warum alle Staaten wie die Lemminger äh, in diese World Trade Organisation gehen, wenn Sie doch wissen, dass das hier untergegangen ist. Ähm, Jetzt werden Sie sagen, das sind sozusagen die herrschenden Interessen, die sich da durchsetzen. Ich glaube, dass tatsächlich, ohne irgendwie Ökonom zu sein, die Dinge etwas komplizierter liegen. Dass nämlich sozusagen die Verlustseite da ist, ganz sicher, wie Sie sie ja vollkommen zutreffend geschildert haben. Dass aber auch eine Gewinnseite da ist. Und nicht nur für eine kleine Clique von Profiteuren, sondern eben auch, sondern eben, ja, natürlich. Ja. ja, ich kann Ihnen auch gerne mal antworten. Nein, es öffnet einfach bestimmte Möglichkeiten, auch kleine und mittlere Unternehmen, sich in einer ganz anderen Art und Weise äh, auf dem Markt, und sei es nur sozusagen der vergrößerte regionale Markt in Asien zum Beispiel, ähm, äh, darzustellen. Das ist einfach Tatsache. Äh, warum glauben Sie denn, dass Portugal und Spanien so viel besser sein, als in der EU sind? Doch nicht nur, weil sie Gelder von, von der Bundesrepublik bekommen. Vielleicht können wir in die, 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 die normale Bahn zurück. Also Herr Jaisbach, Herr, 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 Herr Chomsky, ich habe mit dir. It's not true that all countries follow the World Trade Organization. In fact, no countries do. Uh, those who follow the World Trade Organization are trade ministers, uh, political leaders, corporate leaders, and so on. And the public usually doesn't know about it. Most of the skeptics.
chance to say anything is usually the answer. However, you are correct that it has uh, some good sides to it. You can say the same about Nazism. It has some good sides to it. <laughs> Germany had a depression. Uh, Bolshevism had good sides to it. I mean, it took Russia from a deeply depressed uh, peasant society to a rotten industrial society. <laughs> and, and, uh, almost any horror you can think of in the world. Sie haben so wunderbar treffend über die Konsensmaschine der Medien, der Medien äh, geschrieben. Aber ähm, könnte es sein, dass Sie selbst auch eine Konsensmaschine sind, geboren sind? By the way.
about about 60 percent of the public believed that Iraq was responsible for September 11th, uh, that it was planning further attacks, uh, that uh, had was developing weapons of mass destruction. In other words, a, a large and, and in fact that. Uh, uh, the, uh, those beliefs have been remarkably persistent. We're not quite at the 60% level, but they're still high, because it keeps being reiterated in one form or another by the media. Uh, the, uh, and it, it, as you would expect, uh, holding those beliefs is closely correlated with support for the war. I mean, attitudes for the war were split right down the middle, uh, but those who held those beliefs supported the war. Which is not surprising. I mean, if I believe those things, I'd have supported the war. If you believe those things, yeah, it makes sense to support the war. You want to look a step further. The people who are carrying out the torture in Abu Ghraib, those are people who come from a background where you have those beliefs. And once you get into the Marine Corps, they just intensify the beliefs by indoctrination. So if those people were asked, you know, why to do those things, I'm sure they would say we're taking revenge. I mean, they did it to us. They think they can get away with attacking us everywhere. Okay, we're going to show them. You know. uh, those are widely held beliefs. Of course, the government is happy to have the media circulate them, uh, but it's, a, it's the responsibility of the media for having done it. So yes, there were weapons of mass destruction, and their names are uh, Fox News, CBS News, uh, NPR, or New York Times, or Washington Post, and so on. They didn't have to do it. Uh, later, after it was exposed, they talk about weapons of mass deception. Not at the time when you had to. von der halben Stunde, die Herr Chomsky uns zugestanden hat, haben wir 45 Minuten benutzt. Das ist schon eine halbe Hälfte über unser Konto. Ich möchte Sie alle bitten, dafür Verständnis zu haben. Ich möchte Herrn Chomsky ganz herzlich danken für seine Worte und für seine, sein Auftreten hier bei uns.